Hey everyone, and welcome to a new unit. We are starting our uh, next unit, our final unit on the animal kingdom. And we're gonna start with some of the simpler organisms found in the ocean and work our way up to more complex. And the simplest group or the first main group we're gonna talk about are the invertebrates. These are organisms that lack an internal skeleton of either bone or cartilage. And the simplest of this group is phylum periphera. We're talking about the sponges. For a long time, uh, people thought that sponges were not animals, but actually plants. Sponges are sessile, means they are physically attached to the bottom and they grow upward, very similar to plants. And they don't, they lack organs, they lack organ systems, they don't have a digestive tract, they don't have a mouth. So they just appear to sit there on the seafloor and grow bigger and bigger and bigger. So we th they, they thought they were plants, but actually they are the simplest of all animals. They have the minimum requirements to make an animal an animal. They are multicellular and they are heterotrophic. In addition to being multicellular, they actually have several different types of cells, but their cells are not uh, put together, arranged to form tissue, much less organs and organ systems. So let's talk briefly about their, their structure. They basically have two main tissue types. They have these choanocytes, collar cells are called, and you see these right here. That's these little cells that are attached to the inside of the sponge with flagella. And all these cells do, they're physically attached. They can't get up and move around. They just move the flagella back and forth. And what that does is it pushes water out of the central opening called an osculum. And if water is getting pushed out of here, it also means that water has to be going into that area. So all, all along the side of the sponge are these tiny little pores that water is pulled into and then out of the big holes. So these ostea, the small ones, and the osculum, the big one here. So as that water gets pulled through the sponge, if we use this as an example, this is a synthetic sponge, but uh, you see maybe a bigger hole right there. So water gets pulled through the small holes, water is filtered out, small plankton and whatnot get trapped in there and get stuck, and then the cleaner water comes out of the top. The other type of cell are called the amoebocytes, and there's several types. Some of them build this actual structure, and others move around and capture that food that has been trapped, say diatoms, dinoflagellates, things like that, and digest it themselves or share it with those collar cells, those choanocytes right here, that can't move around, that are fixed. So this is the, this is the way that it works uh, with these sponges. Now, at first you might think, oh, that sounds like a symbiotic relationship, you know, and it does sound like that, but it can't be because these two cells are of the same organism. A symbiotic relationship involves organisms of different species. If you take the DNA of both the choanocyte and the amoebocyte cells and analyze them, they would be identical to each other. Just like the DNA in, our, our, in a heart cell compared to a cell of our, of our, in our eyeball, compared to something in our brain, all those cells in our body have the same DNA because we're all of the same organism with different types of cells. All right, um, other things we can talk about, let's see, um, is a little bit more about these structures. So we look at this picture here. This is a processed sponge, a natural sea sponge that's been cleaned up and you can go to the stores and buy them and stuff like that. And there's reasons for that, which we'll get to in a few minutes. Um, let's go back here. But you see these bigger holes and you can't see the small holes. The ostea are the small ones, we call them pores, and the osculum is the bigger hole where the water exits. So uh, in this diagram here, we see one central osculum and a central cavity, and then you see the pores all on the sides, all around all sides of it. This is something more uh, reminiscent of a, a barrel sponge or a tube sponge, where this is just a different type with lots of these osculums. So uh, that's some of the main structures. The other thing to talk about are spicules and spongin. This material, when you buy a sponge or see a natural sea sponge, imagine this is not fake, uh, that would be the spongin. 
this protein material that the uh, that very easy in trapping uh, particles, very fine pores, uh, kind of like the internal skeleton of the sponge is this material here. There's also these spicules. These are typically they're made of glass, silica, or calcium carbonate, and they're very small and they're very sharp and they 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 give it's kind of like the in, internal skeleton, like the bony skeleton of our bodies. It gives the sponge some support. It makes it stiffer, harder uh, type of structure. Um, and for many organisms, if they were to bite into a sponge, that would, those spicules would be very uh, abrasive and irritating. And we'll talk more about that in a uh, few minutes. Uh, the larval stage. Okay, when, when sponges reproduce, they release egg and sperm into the water. It's called broadcast spawning. They mix in the water, and the zygote forms and develops, uh, and the next generation starts. Well, the first cycle, the first life part of the life cycle is the larval stage, <clears throat> and they are free floating at the mercy of the ocean's currents. But they have the ability to swim. So these microscopic little small uh, uh, sponge larvae can move around. I mean, the ocean's going to take them wherever, they, wherever it wants to take them, but they can swim. So it's kind of like the larval stage of the sponge is more animal-like than the adult stage. Remember, the adult stage is sessile and physically attached to the bottom, where the larval stage can actually move around, which is kind of like a major characteristic that we think of animals, even though it's not really. Uh, not all animals can move or have to move. So yeah, more animal-like. Um, nutrition, I'm not talking about how nutrition, something like this would be if you were to eat it, but we're talking about how does it get its nutrition. And again, I've said this several times, they are filter feeders. So they pull water through them, trapping uh, plankton and digest them for their nutrition. Uh, ecological roles, there's several things that are kind of interesting to talk about. There is competition among sponges. Now, you know, you can't be all that exciting as they just sit there and grow attached to the bottom, but where they attach and actually finding a place to attach, that's where competition uh, does become important because they must have a hard structure to attach to and grow off of. You simply can't have sponges growing on a sandy seafloor. That doesn't work. Predator-prey relationships. There aren't many predators to sponges. There are a few, but some, of the, some sponges produce chemicals. Uh, some have very sharp, stiff, and strong spicules. They, there are some defenses against predators, but there's just simply not many things that will eat sponges to begin with. Symbiotic relationships. There are lots of symbiotic relationships with sponges. The great hiding place for shrimp, small fish, crabs, and stuff like that. And some of them will actually clean the sponge. Uh, there is cases of cyanobacteria, photosynthetic bacteria that live within the tissue, sharing the products of photosynthesis with the sponge, the sponge giving it a a great place to live. And of course, humans, we use natural sea sponges. Uh, more on that in a few minutes. Um, I have a little, uh, I missed the video. I wanna show you this little video that kind of shows the ocean, the water current flowing through a sponge. If it starts. To make the invisible visible, Diaz injects a harmless colored dye into the water near the body of a sponge. One of the ways we can test for the rate of water flow that moves through the sponge body is to inject a colored dye and measure the speed at which it is pumped through the sponge. Actually, for me, this is the first time I've done this and I've been really looking forward to the opportunity for years. And I'm so excited to try this experiment. When I start seeing the color dye coming out of the sponge in less than two seconds from when it was applied, I could not believe my eyes. This steady and strong continuous flow of water continuously coming out of the sponge was an incredible realization of the dynamic existence of this organism. The 
it's an incredible sight to witness. These ghostly exhalations are proof that the sponge is actively pumping. What they did, they took this dye and they squirted it around the outside of a sponge and they sat there for a few seconds. And within seconds, that dye started being pushed out of that central osculum, that central opening, showing how these sponges can create a flow of water. Last thing I want to talk about is something called the sponging industry. This is actually fisher people who go out, collect sponges, process them so they can sell them so people like us can buy them. Uh, I lived on Andros Island for a while. I lived, this is uh, in the Bahamas, and I live right up there just north of Stanier Creek, an area called Stafford Creek. And we used to take school groups that visit us up to an area called Red Bay. And this was a fishing community and there was lots of sponging going on up there. So that's what I want to tell you about how you go from, say, something like this. These are sponges that were collected off of the seafloor and thrown up on the beach to something like that. So let's make this a little bit bigger and I will tell you about it. So let's go over here. So what happens is literally when I was there, they had these fisher, fishermen that would take a little boat, say 12 feet long, a long pole, and they would pull out to the reef because the reef had a lot of hard substrate on the bottom for sponges to grow. And then they had this bucket and they would stick it over the side of the boat and it had a glass bottom to it. They could see down to the bottom and they could spot a sponge. When they saw one, they would take their long pole that they used to pull out to the reef. And at one end, there were these three nails sticking out of the end of it. They would lower that end down until they got next to that sponge and then they would impale the sponge with those nails and they would whip it off the bottom. They would pull it up, take it off the nails, throw it in the boat. They would do this over and over and over until they literally had a boatload of sponges. They'd go back to the beach. They would take their sponges and they would toss them up on the beach. They would start to dry out and they would die and they would start to stink. So they did that for a couple of days. Then they would take these big paddles and they would start beating the sponges on the sides like that all over the place and that would start to break up a lot of those spicules making the softer and a lot of that organic matter would start to fall off so once they did this they would take uh, the sponges now and they would throw them back in the ocean and not quite that simple they had set up out in the water in the shallow water something called a corral k-r-a-a-l basically a series of sticks in a circle kind of to trap the sponges they would toss them inside of that it was like gaps about that big Fish and crabs and shrimp would be able to go in there, feed on all that dead organic material, and you'd have a sponge after a few days that had more of this kind of color. Then they would take them and put them back on the, on the beach, and they might have to break them up a little bit more. They would take this sponge, and they would take this long rope, you see here, had a big long needle attached to one end, and they would impale, oops, they would impale the sponge right to the middle, and they would string it on the string like that. And they would do it. Take the next one, same thing, held like that until they had a big string of you know the whole length of string lined up with all these sponges, kind of like a popcorn uh, garland that you string popcorn to put on your Christmas tree. And then they would take this, tie it up on, on branches and trees, and drape it around the beach area, allowing these sponges to dry. Once they're dried, they're almost done. They would take them off of the string. Then they would take a machete and they would chop off any bad edges. They would have the bottom nice and flat so it sits up nice and neat. And then they had a finished sponge. They would take the sponge to Nassau or other places and sell them in the markets. And that's how it works. Here in Florida, uh, we also have a sponging industry in an area called Tarpon Springs on the west coast of Florida. There's a lot of people that go out and sponge. The question is, why do they do this? Uh, why do they go through all this work when we can make a synthetic sponge a lot cheaper without killing anything? So it's kind of key. Why do they do this? And let's see if I can get this to work.
Um, and if we look here, you know, why do these, why do people, why is there a demand, a need for, for real sponges? Real sponges have a lot of really good uses. A lot of people wash their cars with it, wash babies with it, apply makeup to your face and clean your face, cleaning optics like glasses, microscopes, telescopes. And the bottom line is a true sea sponge is softer than the best synthetic sponge that, that's out on the market. So if you need a really, really, really soft, non-abrasive uh, type sponge, you're better off buying a real sponge. Now, are there other reasons why people buy real sponges? Yes, of course. One of the reasons is simply for decoration. Put them in their bathrooms, put some soap in them and things like that. I know we got a couple in ours here. So um, there is, a, there is an, a need, there is a demand. And so there's gonna be people that go out there and actually collect the sponges. Um, kind of a, a fun note, I remember when I was in the Bahamas and I would talk to the fishermen that would go out and they'd always tell me the sponges are getting smarter. Now, me being a scientist, a biologist, I knew that that was not the case. They don't have a brain, they can't get smarter. But I'd ask the, the people that went out and caught them and collected them, how do you know they're getting smarter? Because they're only, they would tell me, they only find them in deeper and deeper and deeper water. They're only finding them now in water that's too deep to use their pole to collect them. So obviously they're getting smarter. When the real case is they were getting overfished, over harvested, so there were none in the shallow waters. So that was the real reason. So back, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago, there were a lot of people that would come down the Bahamas and they would visit these communities and try to teach them how to properly, uh, sustainably collect sponges. And instead of ripping them off the bottom, which would remove the whole sponge off of that rock or that substrate, they would tell them to dive down and use a knife and cut them off the bottom, leaving about this much uh, still attached to the, to the rock. Guess what that piece would do? It would grow back into another one. So rather than completely removing them, it would leave some behind to grow in a matter of months later, they would come back and they can harvest that one again. So kind of a neat fact there. Um, let's see. And uh, I guess the last thing to talk about is another, a, a few little interesting things. And if you look at this picture here, there are some that actually form uh, glass uh, type uh, uh, skeleton structures like this. I have one in the classroom in one of those black brain boxes. Um, some produce chemicals that are being investigated and studied by the pharmaceutical companies for potential drugs, especially anti-cancer and cancer cures. And, uh, so a lot of neat little things. So that's a little bit on sponges, phylum periphera, and uh, answer the questions that follow this video. Thanks a lot.